Okay, I'll close the door. Yeah, we're rolling. Okay. Oh, hello. Welcome to another session of our Learning Glass Studio. Um, today we'll talk about more science and physics and fundamental behavior of matter in the universe, energy, transport, all of that. Wide with this stuff is the root of a lot of our physical phenomena and very important for engineering analysis and um, a lot of the equations we use do not need, they can be used, but the, the way that we can understand what's going on at the fundamental level of how these equations work is the simplest case can be described by kinetic theory. And um, we're going to talk about even a simplified version of kinetic theory but it gives you a lot of the brute behavior of why we can use kinetic theory. So what is kinetic theory? It's a, a big summary of what kinetic theory is based on comes from the Maxwell Boltzmann distribution of energy and uh, Maxwell use kinetic theory. So this uh, kinetic theory predates this uh, distribution, but now it pretty, uh, this, once this advance in the theory was introduced by Maxwell and later refined by Boltzmann, it has become, uh, this whole theory is based upon this concept. That, that concept being that you can plot. You can first assume that gases and liquids, in all matter for that matter, are composed of atoms and molecules. And um, liquids and solids are more fluid. I mean, liquids and, and uh, gases are more fluid. So this is more easy to apply, the fact that they're always in motion and what happens with these gases and liquids is that they're always flying about and colliding with each other. They fly in a straight line and then they collide. That's what Boltzmann started with. But what he um, postulated was that if you have an ensemble of molecules in the gas specifically, you can draw a profile of their energies and their energies, it's not all the same energy. Each pocket of gases has different energies distribution and some are slower, some are faster. And the point is he connected it to assume that if we don't worry about the potential energy yet, we can first assign this energy to kinetic energy. And we can say that each individual um, molecule has a certain energy level where we describe it as some specific energy level uh, weighted by temperature. So he says that it's a distribution consisting of each individual energy level and then normalized by all energy levels. So here, the assumption was two things. A, that it's tied to kinetic energy. So as a function of speed, we don't have to specify the direction. It's just that we know that they're moving at a certain speed and that for a given temperature, um, you have a certain shape of this distribution. So how it works is that if you have a certain lower temperature T1, it has a distribution centered around some lower speed. But if you go to a higher temperature, the distribution widens a little bit, but you have a faster speed. So here T2 is greater than T1. So what the advance was, 
that Maxwell first introduced was that you can use temperature to uh, quantify the kinetic energy of the molecules in your system. Again, these molecules are there. They're the individual building blocks of uh, matter. And for liquids and solids, there's enough space in between them that uh, it's not a continuous hunk of, of matter. It's individual atoms and molecules. And for liquids and fu uh, fluids, they're actually flying around in empty space. And that speed is related to the temperature. And they also collide, and we'll use that as well. And um, th that's where this Boltzmann constant comes from. It's the proportion of energy to temperature related by this Boltzmann's constant. Okay, so uh, when we do that, we can integrate. We can uh, do a lot of mass analysis that we did last time in terms of integrating this distribution in terms of velocities and when we do that that allows us to get a velocity probability then when we do that we can get the mean of the magnitude of the velocity. What is that speed? It's the mean speed. So to do that into proper um, nomenclature, we have a velocity vector. The magnitude of that is the speed. So the mean speed. And the result we had last time was that uh, classical result that you might see over and over again if you continue these studies is that um, based on this theory of this distribution with temperature, that you can put a, a, a mean on this distribution, depending on the temperature, and that turns out to be depending upon the temperature, so there's a Boltzmann's constant again, and the mass of your uh, particle that's flying around. So this is the mean velocity, the mean molecular velocity, assuming the, this distribution is, holds. And the reason why this is such a big advancement is because this is pretty much a good way to start that on the first order, it explains a lot of physical behavior. You have to go into more details to get more accurate, but overall, just based on this temperature mass relationship to the kinetic energy, you can explain a lot. And um, so it's all putting a number on the, on the velocity of these particles moving. And what the direct application we're going to use next is that based on the mean uh, velocity of these molecules at a certain temperature, you can um, reason out how fast they collide with each other. Because again, liquids and solids I'm sorry, liquids and gases, there are in some, um, some amount of empty space, gases especially, and they're always colliding with each other. They fly in a straight line until they collide and go into a different random direction. That explains a lot of behavior. So how does that explain it? Well, let's look at um, two different molecules, one molecule of a certain size and another molecule of a different size. So each molecule has different atoms a different molecular formula, and that on the first order simplification results in a different size of their uh, electron cloud and their uh, size in physical space. But we can model that as just a hard shell of a billiard ball, basically. So let's say we have a molecule B that we're gonna just model as a hard sphere it's more complicated than that, but like I said, on the first order, this does work really well. Of some diameter we're going to call sigma A, and it has a mass of A. And what this is flying about, according to this, uh, we can assign a mean speed to this thing by its temperature and by its uh, mass. So when it's flying about, it's going to go in a straight line until it collides. 
Okay, so what that would look like was that let's put an axis um, at its center line. This is the center of mass here of uh, the A molecule. And then not the center of mass, but an important axis because if you can think about it, the way that it collides with another molecule is if something is in its path. Its pathway goes along the volume of its, uh, the, the size of this thing. So if we have another molecule, let's say it's smaller, so this would be sigma b size, smaller, and with the smaller mass, of course, it will collide with any molecules, both of itself and this molecule, as long as it's within this uh, axis that it has to come in contact with its pathway. So this is the, the closest it needs to be before it collides. If it's in here, it'll collide. And if it's right at the edge, it will collide. So that defines our so-called collision cross-section, our so-called collision volume, our so-called collision diameter. So how do we draw that? So if this is um, the volume that this molecule is occupying, then if we say that anything with a center of mass within this volume, so the center of mass goes like this. For a sphere, it goes along its center. So we can draw another cylinder um, anywhere within that cylinder. So this would be the collision volume. Anything within um, this uh, radius, so anything, this would be sigma b divided by 2. This would be sigma a divided by 2. So what we've done is we defined that anything within this volume will collide if they encounter each other. If they're on the same pathway, anything within this volume will collide. And what is this volume? It's a cylinder of radius with these two. So if these um, we said that the collision diameter is, let's call it sigma AB, is one half so it's this but um, just by convention, collision diameter is the diameter of these two combined, but it's actually the radius. It forms a diameter because you're kind of having an effective diameter of combining these two. But what the collision diameter is, it's the radius of the collision volume. So it's the... Uh, radius of cylinder where collision is, is possible or collision will occur. So that helps us because um, when, we, when we collide, as we know from simple physics, when we collide, energy gets exchanged. When we collide, uh, what we may not remember or uh, wasn't discussed yet in chemistry, how do you react from, uh, to, from the products? Let's say these two are some molecules. If there's a reaction that can happen between molecule A and molecule B to form a new molecule, the only way that that can happen is they have to see each other first. How do they see each other first in the gas and liquid phase? They have to collide. So this also ties into um, not only an exchange of energy, but possibly an exchange of um, a chemical reaction, a exchange of electrons, which could result in a product. So that, this is also tied to that. 
So the question then is, how do we analyze that next? Well, let's, um, let's say that this molecule, according to the uh, mass mole dose, uh, kinetic theory, collision theory, mass mole Boltzmann distribution of energy, each of these molecules is moving at a certain uh, velocity. Okay, so we're going to analyze this as a system of colliders. And uh, as we may remember from physics, we can do that by defining the relative mass. If you remember, relative mass is, looks like this. It's not like an average, but it's related. So if this, if this is a collision system we're going to analyze, well, we're going to look at the relative mass of these two bodies, and then the relative velocity, of course. So we can define, use this analysis of the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution to also assign a relative mean molecular velocity to say that the uh, mean of this relative velocities pulling from the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution is related to the relative mass. Okay, so if we have, so now we can start to answer how fast do they collide? How fast they collide depends on how many are in the, this fluid, how many of A in, are in this fluid, how many of B in this fluid. How fast they collide also depends on the volume of their collision volume, which is related to the collision diameter, and it depends on how fast they're moving. So let's reason those out next. So this mean molecular velocity is related to the fact that uh, Boltzmann hypothesized that you can assign most of this energy to kinetic energy, which can, you can relate to temperature by the by this shape of this function here. And then that's how this um, number was placed on the mean molecular vo velocity in terms of temperature because it's assuming that the energy is kinetic energy, that's where we get velocity, and um, the temperature help is, a, is the, basically a definition of temperature is quantifying the relationship to uh, kinetic energy, and that also ties into thermodynamics, is what we are taught is that the internal energy of a system is the molecular energy of a system. What is the molecular energy of the system? Similar to Boltzmann, we assume it's mostly kinetic energy of uh, the molecules. So that's also related to temperature in uh, thermodynamics. We say that we can relate energy, internal energy, to temperature by using specific heat. Enthalpy is closely related to internal energy. We can use another specific heat to link temperature to energy. Okay, so let me get this. So, what we did was we defined our collision volume where a collision will happen. That depends on the cross-sectional area of the cylinder. That's defined by the radius of the cylinder. That radius is called collision diameter. But you know what we mean. The diameter comes from the fact that we're adding up 
uh, it's like an effective diameter of the two bodies, but it forms the radius of this cylinder. So what we can say is given number densities Um, NA and NB, which will be numbers per volume, let's say centimeter cubed, those are typical um, volume, the scale of the, this analysis we do, centimeter cubed. And um, so if we're going to take the perspective of A, or here's A, over time, if this it's moving, if it moves in this straight trajectory, it's going to sweep out from here to there in one second. So per unit time, it goes from here to there. That means it sweeps out um, this cross-sectional area of the cylinder and the length of the cylinder. So that would be the velocity per time times this area. So A... sweeps out a cylinder over time at a rate of, let's say, pi while the relevant volume that we care about, it's not this uh, pathway of this um, single molecule, it's this whole collision diameter because if we care about the collisions and saying that when A moves, the relevant volume is this um, collision diameter. So the area of a cylinder, uh, this, the cylinder cross-section is pi r squared. So in this case, the radius of the relevant cylinder is the um, collision diameter. That's the radius. It's related to the individual diameters. And then if it's sweeping out the cylinder, it sweeps it out at a rate related to the velocity, the relative velocity of these two. So this is the cross-sectional area of the collision volume and it sweeps out at a rate according to the velocity, relative velocity. Then it collides with, with B, uh, number of B, B number of molecules So what is the number of molecules? It's the, the um, inside this volume, there's a number density, a number per volume times the collision volume we're concerned with. So what is the collision volume we're concerned with? It's similar to this. So it's the same volume, except that the number of molecules would be the number density of B times the volume that we are um, concerned with. So if we put that together, so for um, NA number density of molecules, the total collisions per volume is what we're going to call ZA per volume per time. We're going to call it ZAB, the collision rate. It depends on the number density of A molecules you have depends on the number density of B molecules you have times a, co a collision uh, cross-section. And the, the, the volume swept depends on the relative velocity. 
And if we plug in this relative velocity, we can relate it to temperature and the mass of each of these molecules. Okay, so with, by taking this, um, saying that we know the velocity, well, we don't need to know the velocity to work out this logic that if we know the size, we know that it maps out a certain volume where they can collide. And as they're moving around, they sweep out this volume uh, determined by the cross section where they can collide. And um, depending on how fast they're moving, that determines, on, that determines how, um, how much volume they sweep. And the, 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 the number of collisions that happen with time to, depends on how much volume they sweep. It also depends on how many there are in that volume, the number densities, N, A, and N, B. So that's what we have here. Then on top of that, we're able to put some more tangible um, numbers on the velocity by assuming Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution of energy, saying that the, the velocity you're moving at depends on the temperature, depends on the mass. So here we have a collision rate depending on the size of your colliders, the mass of your colliders, and the temperature. That's a very powerful result of kinetic theory, which is a, a part of it is this collision theory here, and another big part of it is this Maxwell-Boltzmann mean velocity result. So this would be the number of collisions per centimeter cube per time, for example, per second, depending on which unit you use. Okay, so that's good. That, so this is actually a direct theoretical limit of chemical reaction rates. Chemical reaction rate is how fast does this do these reactants get converted to products. So if you want to do a chemical reaction, you want to convert these two starting molecules into new molecule products. The only way you can do that in the physical universe is for these two molecules to collide with each other, to see each other. The way that they see each other is they, they're flying in space and they, and they hit each other. And how do they hit each other? Depends on the size, the temperature, and the mass. And so the fastest they can possibly react to form products is limited by the fastest they can possibly collide with each other. So this is a very um, high limit. It's actually lower. There's actually more criteria. But if you want to do a chemical reaction among these molecule A and molecule B at this number density in the gas or the liquid, the fastest they can possibly react is their collision rate. Um, this is one way to estimate the collision rate because they have to see each other first. How do they see each other? They collide at this rate. And, um, but for chemical reactions, there's more criteria. You have to approach each other at the right way. Instead of A colliding with A, A has to collide with B and so forth. But um, this is the upper, upper ceiling on how fast they can react. Physical theoretical limit is based on the collision rate. Okay, so another question is if we now talk about the whole mixture, so if we let N, A, B, be the total number density in this mixture we're talking about. Then we can say uh, for a single, let's focus on one of these A molecules. For a single A molecule, um, Per unit time, like in one second, A collides 
with the collision cross section times of a relative velocity. So um, so that's the volume it sweeps. And then if we're talking about the whole mixture, it's going to collide with this many molecules, the whole mixture times the collision volume. So if we're going to do that, we can define another collision uh, rate to say that just A, ZA is a collision rate of just A colliding, one molecule of A colliding with anything else. That's different than here. It's saying that uh, all collisions, no matter if it's A or B, we're saying only A. So that would be the total number density And this is just number per second, number of collisions per second. Per, uh, yeah, just per second, not per volume. Because the vol this is volume units per time, this is uh, number density. So the, uh, the volume cancels out. So that's important because what we're doing here is this is good for chemistry. This is good for telling us how many collisions uh, between A and B occur, or co total collisions. That's good for chemistry because we need them to collide with each other. This, we're just focusing on the properties of one of the molecules. The properties of one of the molecules could tell us a material property of this molecule, as we'll talk about. So the next question is, um, if we know the collision rate of just A, how, fat, how much distance does it travel between collisions? That's a very important property for this physical behavior of A. So we know how much A collides with everything in this uh, surroundings. How far path, uh, what is the path that it travels before it collides? That's the mean free path. So we can find the mean free path, the average path that it travels before it collides based on how, much, how many collisions occur with time and the mean velocity that this has. So that's related to um, these, what we've analyzed so far. So the mean free path when you, when you design mean free path, it has to be tied to, to one of those molecules, not the whole mixture. The mean free path of A in this mixture is what we're going to analyze. We could also analyze the mean free path of B in this mixture. And it depends, the, what, the question you're asking depends on which velocity you assign and which collision cross-section you design. Uh, we are talking about the mean free path of a in mixture A, B. So that is the distance traveled, the, um, distance A travels before collision. Or it collides with something, what's the distance before the next collision? Any collision, A or B. So, you can find that it's called AB, I mean uh, lambda most of the time, let's call it lambda AB. So we're gonna find lambda AB, <coughs> excuse me, lambda AB, we're going to say, okay, we know how fast this is moving. That's the uh, velocity it's traveling over time. And we can cancel out the time by saying, we know how fast it's traveling uh, per time, how many collisions is happening per time. That's this new ZA we found. 
So by dividing this, it tells us the distance it travels per unit time, and then it tells us the collisions that travel one time. So this is literally going to be the distance traveled per one collision. And if we plug these in, it will be related to the number density in the mixture and the collision cross-section and the relative velocity of this mixture. That will cancel out. So then um, the mean free path of A in B, well, I'll just do A here. This should be just A. Yeah. So that's that. So that's the mean free path of A in this mixture here. Depends on how many particles are in the mix and depends on how what the size of these particles are. And um, I guess it's a good time to show now that another important um, application of Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution of energy is that you can relate energy to temperature. And um, when uh, you have these gases flowing, applying it to an ideal gas, you can assign the energy as kinetic energy and by doing that, you have this, uh, it's, a, it's a theoretical explanation to the observations already seen that the uh, pressure, volume, and temperature are all related to each other in terms of their coupled by the ideal gas equation. So we can, uh, with the ideal gas equation, As we know, the NL, uh, ideal gas equation may be defined as PV equals nRT, which would be uh, where N is moles. I guess we'll call oh, oh, moles. We're going to use N later. And um, what the Maxwell-Boltzmann version of this is that equals N and the, the number the actual number of molecules times kT. So instead of moles of the molecules, it's the number of the molecules. And what that shows is that moles times R equals number times K. And what is that number? Avogadro's number. So the uh, most common way to use this ideal gas equation is use this universal gas constant. And the reason why the universal gas constant is universal is because this analysis of these, it's all about the collisions, and the collisions depends on numbers, not on um, the type, the number, of the number of energy carriers. Each one has their energy, this KT. So if we apply this version, we can say that P where N is the density, N over V, and we can apply a different version of the ideal gas. We can say that um, P equals NKT, N equals P over KT. So the mean free path depends on the pressure, total pressure, times the collision cross-section. So here the mean free path then depends on the pressure. You can put different weights on it, go in terms of universal gas constant and Avogadro's number. 
But here, um, we know what going into the microscopic level, it depends on how many are there. The ideal, by the ideal gas equation, a direct measure of how many are there uh, the, is related to the number density. And by the ideal gas equation, that um, macroscopically shows up in terms of the pressure of the system and the temperature, of course. So that is one way to describe the um, mean free path. Okay, so let's use this even more. So now let's use this to find specific physical properties of these molecules. Transport properties is, I'm not sure how many mechanical engineers have encountered these concept of transport properties. We have used them, but they aren't, they may not be tied to the concept of transport properties. Uh, another way to say transport properties is transfer process. So heat transfer is, uh, can also be called tra heat transport. And the property of, of heat transport, the, the heat transfer processes are determined by transport properties. That's what we mean by transport. And that word specifically is used because the behavior depends upon collisions of molecules. And the transfer of heat is collisions of molecules resulting in an exchange of energy. So we're going to apply that next, but unless even less common one for um, mechanical engineers is mass transport, mass transfer. So we may, talked about that a little in class. So the way to see how this works is we can draw in space these planes. So this would be kind of like a control volume analysis. Okay, so if this would be zero, and this would be a one-dimensional analysis where um, this is x equals zero, this is x minus um, a distance, and this distance is, is not a random distance. So what we're saying is that if a molecule was here, and this distance is chosen, to be the mean free path. So here from here to this plane, it's one collision to a collision here on this plane. Then here, similarly, it's a collision uh, from this plane. Oh, not going in that direction, but similarly, a molecule from this plane went this direction, from the right to the center. So um, this distance <clears throat> is a mean free path or something of thereof. So what we're saying is, it's, not the, it's, a, it's on an angle, but this, that's what this distance is saying, something like that. Um, so um, each plane is a mean free path away. Uh, is each plane, there's only a one collision, yeah, they're like, a molecule collision from a plane to zero plane. So this transport is because it collides here, goes into a random direction, and goes across this plane. Same thing here. From random direction, goes across this plane. So we can characterize that by the mean free path. That's the definition. The distance it travels before um, collision. So this would be one collision, and the next collision would be one mean free path away. Okay. So if we define the flux, uh, some molecular flux would be um, J 
the number crossing per area per time, we can say the flux across zero equals the left flux minus the right flux. Where if we look at this diagram, it turns out to be um, the fact that this molecule is coming from the right and it's going at a certain velocity for this system. Let's assign this relative velocity and it's carrying with it. Uh, I mean, and that happens, the, the um, rate that that happens depends on the number density. So the, um, uh, at that moment, so there's also a factor of one fourth there for three dimensional space. So I'll just put this one fourth, so for like 3D. Um, so it depends on the relative velocity and then it depends on the number density at that location. So the number density at x minus lambda minus the number density at x plus lambda. So the one mean free path away. Okay. So, so right flux minus the left flux. No, we don't need the total, we need this single. So that's the total, that's good for chemical reactions, but for, um, in terms of this mean free path and the transport property of one component, we're gonna use this one molecule colliding with everything else. Not both, not all the collisions in the system, just this one thing colliding. So if we do that, and we take the limit as delta x goes to zero, or like over, if we expand this into a differential, we would show that this flux equals negative one half, um, this relative velocity times this mean free path, what I call it, A, times the mean free path of A, times uh, um, d and dx. So that's like a control volume analysis of the flux due to collisions going across. It depends upon the speed that they're moving and uh, if we take the differential limit, it also depends on the distance that we define here across this plane. And um, that looks like Fick's law, negative D, A, B, D, N, so that gives us a way to connect this um, transport property called diffusivity. Diffusivity captures the um, expansion of mass over time and space. The units are meters squared per second. And um, that is the per coefficient in front of this temperature, uh, this concentration gradient. So uh, we'll talk about that, but before that, what we can see upon inspection is that, um, We can, re we can find how the, D, the diffusivity relates to this collision theory, which allows us to, to relate to more tangible parameters like temperature and pressure and number density. So upon inspection, DAB equals one half VR lambda A, which would be um, if we plug in these tangible parameters, it's 
Um, I skipped some step. Let's not. Let's do the. That's the velocity, and over the. That's the mean free path. And from and we can relate that to the ideal gas equation. So from this analysis, we can get from collision theory that the diffusivity depends on the pressure of your system, the size of your molecules, and the temperature, and the mass. So these are all properties of the molecules that we can get some diffusivity from based on this control volume-like analysis of uh, the colliders here. Okay. So let's apply this again to show that when we talk about transport properties, it covers three things. Mass transport, the diffusivity is the um, material or system property for mass transport. It also applies to heat transport, heat transfer, thermal diffusivity and thermal conductivity are the primary properties for that. And uh, so I guess let's talk about mass transport what we're doing here is what we said is that at um, x minus lambda and x plus lambda, let's just assume that there's a lot of particles here on this plane. Then there's a little trickle of particles here. What it says that at t equals zero, this is what it looks like. But then at t greater than zero, you're basically going to have a spread. So this would be x plus lambda, x minus lambda. Depending on how long you wait, this is going to start to flux over. So it might be still dense, dense the most dense here. So this would be t greater than zero. So the concentration gradient goes from left to right. So the, the transport um, happens in that, the, the mass goes in that direction on the opposite of this uh, dt dx, d, dc dx. And this motion is not because there's a breeze blowing in that direction. It happens because they're always colliding and if they are always colliding, it's going to result in these collisions, these random, random motions eventually distributing itself uh, in, in space. So, and the rate that that happens is related to the time you wait and the diffusivity of this system, which depends on the pressure, the temperature, and the uh, mass and the size. So it depends on the molecules you're walking with, to working with, not the pressure across, no pressure drop. The pressure in the system indirectly tells you the number density, so how many collisions are happening. Okay, so let's apply this now to um, energy, or maybe let's do viscosity next. So what is viscosity? It's the resistance to shear stress. I'll talk about that next, and that's a, that's a transport property. Viscosity is a measure of momentum transport in the normal, not where the motion is happening, the net motion is happening, it's uh, the communication and momentum across the layers that are perpendicular to where the motion is happening.
So this is where our analysis for mass colliding and spreading in space. Let's talk about momentum. Collisions that are transfer momentum, which results in a distribution of momentum over time and space. So that's a similar behavior. We're going to have molecules coming in this direction. Um, that collision happened here. The collision is going to happen here. It, these molecules have a mass and velocity. It's going to, that, that's a momentum transfer from there to here. These systems, these molecules have a mass and velocity. It's going to re result in a momentum transfer. So we can look at that in terms of viscous flow. So if this is the x direction, um, we're going to put momentum transfer in the, in the x direction. And how that happens is um, you have, if you had a viscous flow between two channels, and if you moved one of these um, walls, and it was a viscous uh, liquid in between, a viscous fluid, you would bring um, the viscous fluid this direction. This would be the V wall as well. And when you do that, the velocity will have a distribution in this Y direction. Oh, I'm sorry, this, that was, I, I got the unit, the directions wrong. So this would be, um, if Y is down this way, this would be X. So if the bulk motion due to this force, this driving force, put, pulling this viscous flow liquid around, that viscous force is in the Y direction. And that's pulling the convective flow in the y direction, but the momentum due to viscosity is transferred in the x direction. So this would be collisions. Um, the viscosity acts in the x direction for this case. So we can uh, picture between each mean free path there's a transfer in the S direction of momentum. So how would that work? So the net flux of momentum let's call it P dot double dot flux meaning a area per area so the uh, um, force force times the, what is momentum mass times velocity so it's related to the force. We'll do a balance on that. That would be the momentum flux. If we do this from the left and the right, it will be related to two times the velocity of this uh, colliders times the number density in the mixture times the relative mass. And uh, so each component I mean, each molecule is carrying a momentum that's given by the velocity of that molecule and the mass of that molecule. And if it's the system of colliders, it's the relative mass and the relative velocities. So this is the left flux and this is the right flux. 
And again, taking the limit, um, delta x goes to zero, we can write that um, the net flux of momentum When you take the limit, the distance comes out, and the differential is the velocity gradient in the x direction, perpendicular to the net motion. The next motion is in the um, y direction, but the, the momentum transfer occurs in the x direction for viscosity purposes. So what that allows you to say is that if we can compare that to Newton's viscous law, Newton's viscous, that would be the flux of the momentum or the viscosity, or, or okay, let's write Newton's viscous. That's how he describes this situation where if you have flow in the y direction, there's going to be a transfer momentum in the perpendicular direction. So that gives us a relationship between this macroscopic bulk property that we've observed and experiments and Newton developed this correlation, empirical, semi-empirical theory. He explained it in terms of theory, but it's also just an observation that you can see that there's this coefficient called viscosity, which describes this flow depending on the fluid. Well, that's a transport property, and by the collision theory, we can um, use this analysis to combine to um, trace it to these collisions, and that would be So in this case, the viscosity only depends upon the uh, temperature, the mass, and the size. Doesn't depend on pressure in this case or number density. But we apply the same analysis. It's but by the laws of physics. Physics, what we've seen is that energy, mass, and momentum, they have these same proportions, and that happens because of collisions. The reason why they have the same math is because it's the same mechanism of transport. You're limited by collisions, um, which depends on these processes that we discussed. The mean free path, the velocity, and the uh, size that determines the collision volume. Okay, one more example that we have worked with before, um, and it pops out this same coefficient that we should be familiar with already. It's uh, energy which we know is uh, largely an analyzed in terms of heat transfer. So a system does not have heat, but it has energy. It can transfer heat. Heat is a process of transport from one to the other. It's a temporary um, process in between. So to keep track of these molecules, we keep track of their energy, which can be um, quantified by temperature. Again, same molecules, we're just keeping track of a different property. If we say that um, if they're going to collide, there's going to be a net flux of energy. Let's call it E as a function of temperature and space. Um, so if we do the flux balance, we're going to say that the uh, flux as a function of temperature 
is depends on the collisions from the left, the collisions from the right. That's also related to the um, relative velocity. So each um, molecule carries with it uh, mass and the, and the energy level and the mass that it has and then the number density. So that depending on how many there are, the mass of each one and the energy level that it has um, from, and then it comes from the left side. It's one collision away. So it's the same analysis, collisions from the left, collisions from the right. In this case, each molecule has, you know, um, proportional to M and uh, uh, well, I'll show that um, now, is that you can take the limit, of course, and what it turns out is that at the same math as before, you get this expression where the mean free path comes out and it turns into a gradient of energy in space. So if we use internal energy, so this is related to internal energy, this energy level here. So internal energy, sometimes called U, we'll call it E here. Like I said, um, we're assuming that all of this energy is due to the kinetic energy that you can assign to the speed and Maxwell show that you can relate it to the temperature and that's what we do in thermodynamics we combine it to and we call it we're saying it because this is the molecule energy we need to keep track of it with temperature as Maxwell did and that's where the definition of specific heat comes from so for internal energy you relate it to CV and if you do a transform use the chain rule to say that, okay, if I know the gradient in temperature, I can relate that to the gradient in space. When, when you do that, you combine, you say that this is CV dt dx, these two cancel out, and that gives you dE dx. So that's our change in variables there. So that gives you this flux is now becomes two so we re related it to temperature as what is typically done energy is related to temperature one major reason is the Maxwell Boltzmann distribution and if we co compare that to Fourier's law Fourier, we get the flux of energy equals, it's related to the thermal conductivity. So that tells us by the laws of assumptions of um, transport properties and collision theory that the thermal conductivity, it's not random, it's based on the size and the collisions and Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. So based on analyzing the collisions of these molecules, we use Maxwell-Boltzmann's huge leap in progress in our understanding of the physical universe that you can use temperature as a probe into the energy levels of the system. And you do some math, you get some useful one number to assign per each temperature, the mean molecular velocity. And that mean molecular velocity I erased, so it always pops up. That determines how fast they collide. The size of the molecules determines how fast they collide. The um, mass of the molecules determines how fast they collide and how fast they collide determines how they trans they collide when each time they collide mass moves in space and time each time they collide energy transfers in space and time 
Each time they collide, momentum transfers in each space and time. By applying the similar analysis, you get a physical grounding of what each of these coefficients mean that we may have used to analyze problems before. It's that when you're talking about mass diffusivity, how it moves in space just by collisions and, and, and dissipates and makes a uniform uh, uh, velocity concentration gradient, it's related to this uh, parameters of your system, always the size, always the temperature, always the mass. And depending on the specific uh, way that these molecules carry that property, for momentum, it depends on the velocity and the mass. For energy, it depends on the, uh, we can tie it to specific heat, which is a measure of the energy temperature response. And this is just simply counting how many move, how much move from left to right. So it's all ties down to Maxwell Boltzmann distribution and these collisions. Okay, so that's all I had for today. I'll see you guys next time on the next edition of Learning Glass Studio. Thank you.